welcome everyone to the next edition of the Bonner Institute webinar series. I would like to note that this webinar is very special because it is content developed in conjunction with our business partner, the Virtual Advisory Board. And our presenters today, James Bonner and David Cleish, will talk about what the Advisory Board is and how important the partnership is with the Advisory Board to the Bonner Institute. James and David, I'd like to invite you to introduce yourselves as well as the topic. I, of course, will be making some comments and asking questions throughout. James and David, to you. Thank you very much, John. So I'm James Bonner, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Bonner Institute for Purposeful Leadership. We're a company that was founded in 2014, and our focus is to work with high growth companies to optimize their uh, board and executive talent through purpose. We define a purposeful leadership as an ethical decision or choice taken by principal leaders to achieve something greater than themselves and the countries and the countries and the countries, but it's also and the companies that they lead. Countries would be nice, but that's when we go into the political area. So uh, our John mentioned that the Virtual Advisory Board is our business partner. We've been partnering with them now for over a year, and they were kind enough to participate in actively in conducting this uh, survey, and my colleague Dave Cleish will speak more about them. Just by way of background, the Virtual Advisory Board is exactly that. It is an organization of uh, board members, aspiring board members, uh, chief executives and entrepreneurs that are currently, the membership currently is approximately 1,000, 1,100 and we are found in over 70 countries worldwide. It is a very active organization, and those who would like more um, information, I strongly recommend that you go to their website, and um, you will not be disappointed. So, Dave, I'll pass it over to you now, please. Thank you, James. Thank you, John. My name is Dave Gleish. I'm the president and CEO of TMD. We are an integrated marketing firm located in Canada with deep roots uh, serving the professional services industry um, with expertise in marketing research and analysis um, and how we can use those insights gained to validate strategy and to affect performance. And of course, this naturally um, allows us to provide insights to leadership teams um, so that they can be effective in managing their organization and managing their teams to those performance objectives. As James mentioned, we conducted a, an exercise in partnership with the Virtual Advisory Board um, consisting of two parts. The first part being uh, a quantitative um, aspect to the research, which was an online survey um, that we sent out to about 800 of its members. And then we had a qualitative component to the research um, which involved a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews, which I'm going to ask my colleague James at the right moment to jump back in and share some of those insights. But to get us started, why don't I give you a little bit of background on the engagement um, and how it was conducted. So the scope of the engagement, as I said, reached out to um, VAB members. Uh, we wanted to be able to index and benchmark um, current board and C-suite governance efforts with peers across VAB's membership. We focus our areas of inquiry uh, for the online survey in the following key areas, brand and culture, leadership, stakeholder experience, internal communications, data and analytics, technology. And we also asked them how they were currently defining um, ROI for their investment and purposeful leadership. The value that it provides, um, we were able to ask respondents to articulate current state adoption and the status of leadership development engagements. We were able to benchmark those responses relative to their peers and how they responded. We identified existing strengths and areas that could be leveraged to support change within their respective organization. Certainly, we identified areas um, and opportunities for improvement. We were able to um, start to articulate 
organizational risks associated with growth and change objectives. These, of course, all led to strategic development considerations um, based on those above key factors. And as I mentioned, um, we were able to start to get a sense of what the expectations for a potential ROI from investments in leadership development looked like across those that responded. How did it work? We reached out um, through VAB members and asked them to complete a series of questions within each of those core categories that I outlined earlier. Each answer was based on how they viewed their current state at their respective firms or organizations, recognizing that each of them would have a different perspective based on where they were at. Each response was scored, resulting in a score for each critical area and an aggregate score for their businesses as a whole. This aggregate score triggered what we call the Bonar in Index um, that was used to benchmark current state adoption amongst their peers and colleagues. So not only to give them uh, analysis and feedback based on their respective responses, but for them to see how they were faring against their peers. The ranking system designed deliberately to be as objective as possible. So rather than asking respondents a subjective question, such as how well do you think you're doing in this particular area? Um, because everybody's perspective will be a little bit different. Um, we merely ask them to give us a sense of their perception on progress based on a series of key statements. And I'm gonna walk you through those so you get a sense of what we were asking them to respond to. Those um, response options range from not at all, so still managing in silos or as a series of one-offs, very limited, starting to get there and leverage some of those lessons learned and they're starting to see consistency in a couple of different areas. Getting there, still work to do, limited deployment, and we're looking specifically within one or two functional areas of the business, well along, but need to keep going. So broader cross-business development, um, but now we're starting to see documented processes and engagements, defined roles and responsibilities for employees, and they're starting to see increased business adoption and acceptance, all the way up to fully deployed. So this means fully integrated with business strategy, process, and technology, and certainly um, giving them the option to indicate that they were not sure uh, or they did not know. The first area that we jumped into was brand and culture. So just by way of definition, a brand is how your customers, employees, and other stakeholders perceive your company. It's how you differentiate position and communicate value that defines who you are and why you do what you do. <clears throat> Five questions in each section. And this, we focus strictly on business and the brand, seeking to understand that the, is there alignment between business strategy, the brand promise that they make to their customers and internal culture? How strong was purpose defined? So that's purpose, vision, and mission. Are those things embedded in the brand across segments and products? Is the business model relevant? Does it provide a differentiated value in the markets they serve? Right down to deployment. So does the, is the organization's voice, culture, and reputation, are those consistently leveraged and deployed with all of their stakeholder groups? And is that brand and culture a core component of their selling proposition? And as you can see, we ask them to rank those statements or respond to those statements based on how well sorry, not how well, how far along they feel they are with having that instituted and implemented within their organization. Second area that we dove into is leadership. Leadership is about how your executive leads, manages, and achieves the goals of the organization. We asked them specifically about executive endorsement. Does leadership lead by example? Do they demonstrate accountability for ensuring the organization's business strategy? is aligned with those values and culture? Are they actively facilitating transparent and cross-functional collaboration across their business units? Are the board and C-suite aligned and have they developed a proactive and productive working relationship? James is going to speak a little bit more on this. Um, there was some interesting commentary uh, during the one-on-ones in this particular area as well. Performance. 
our C-suite regularly communicating business opportunities, risks, and challenges with the board and the senior leadership? And are the C-suite and board performance, are they aligned with business performance? Uh, and is there confidence um, in the advisory and operational leadership? Stakeholder experience. How your stakeholders feel about the experience they have when they engage with you. Business and the brand. Is there a holistic view of the stakeholder experience across the whole organization? Value delivery. Are those insights from stakeholder feedback broadly communicated? Are they used to innovate and design and identify areas requiring improvement? From a business operation perspective, and by that we mean people, processes, and technology, are those aligned with stakeholder expectations? Alignment. Customer satisfaction and advocacy, referred to as NPS, do those metrics align with internal performance um, and financial performance? And is there alignment between the brand and employee behaviors required to deliver that desired experience and the business performance that results from it? Internal communications. Internal communications and the alignment between informed and engaged employees and successful external activities, as we know, is an important indicator of success. We ask them about rewards and recognition. Do they communicate and leverage superior interactions between customers and employees so they can learn from them, recognize them, and celebrate them? Training and development. Does the organization use business goals to recruit talent? and develop and maintain the skills required to deliver the best value for those customers or stakeholders. Communication and collaboration. Internal communications between leadership and frontline. How open is it? Is it transparent? Is it frequent? Have they created those mechanisms to assure that all teams and departments feel, feel informed, aware, and engaged? And is it a culture that attracts rewards and helps retain top talent? From a data and analytics perspective, data and analytics is how you manage targets and goals and how you ensure your results are aligned with your company's investment and in growth. We dug into performance. Has the business clearly articulated goals and objectives that are measurable and have they assigned accountability and responsibility to specific individuals or functions? Are those activities measured and regularly reported on to the organization's board and leadership and employees as well, so that they have a sense of how those identified ROI um, metrics are being realized for all efforts, resources, and costs? Does the organization's budget, is it aligned with performance targets and results? From a data perspective, the organization has access to the data and analytics they need to make the right decision and do the right thing for its employees and its customers or stakeholders? And are the C-suite and board able to leverage the same data and insights to create a complete view of the opportunities and, as we mentioned earlier, the risks involved to the entire organization? Technology. Technology really is the infrastructure that ensures the company operates smoothly and efficiently. We dug into AI. We can't talk about technology without talking about artificial intelligence. Is the organization using AI-based technology to help manage and optimize workflow and business processes? This is an important question. Are the C-suite and board, do they have a balanced view of the risks and opportunities of AI and other smart applications so that they can provide constructive oversight and governance? Has the organization deployed AI across the organization to maximize efficiencies and resource allocation and deployment? From a reporting and integration perspective, how much are organizations using technology to aggregate reporting, forecasting, and opportunities relative to revenue acquisition and retention? And have they combined and aggregated multiple technology systems so that they've started to reduce and eliminate redundancy and manual supporting processes. And then the last area that we took a look at, um, purposeful leadership ROI. Return on investment is the value either delivered or received or recovered by proactively investing in leadership and board development. 
what we were trying to get here was an indication of what the expectation was from an investment in purposeful leadership. So the ROI indicator, the thresholds that we asked them for was in the first three areas, return versus investment. Um, the three areas that we asked them to give us their expectations from a return perspective, the organization's investment in purposeful leadership development programs has, def has a definable return in terms of sustainable performance and revenue generation. The organization's investment in purposeful leadership development has definable return in terms of leadership retention costs. And then likewise, their investment there has a definable return in overall employee retention. And then for the last two questions, the ROI indicator here is a percent impact or multiplier. So what do they expect to see as an increase from a performance perspective, from a retention perspective, from a revenue perspective as a result of those investments? Um, so to what degree does that investment have a definable impact in overall employee satisfaction in culture? And then to what degree does those, do those investments have a definable impact on reputation and shareholder value? So those are the core areas that we ask respondents to speak to. You can see that it's a broad range of topics. What I wanna do now is be able to give you a high level summary of some of the insights and feedback that we received. Summary of results. 750 invitations uh, were sent out to VAB members, 61 complete responses, and we were managed, uh, we managed to complete seven one-on-one -on -one interviews, which as I mentioned, James will speak to um, in a little bit. That's an overall response rate of 8%. What we were able to do is based on their responses, based on their index scores, create three broader categories. The first one uh, we've called engage. That's for respondents who scored between zero and 50 uh, out of a possible 100. Total respondents there, 6.5%. The medium index score was 48.25. The second category, which we've called embed, those respondents that scored between 51 to 75 on the Bonner, in, on the Bonner index, 37.7% um, of respondents fell into this category. The median index in this case was 65.09. The third category we've called Excel, those respondents that scored between 76 to 100. 21.3% um, of respondents um, fell into this category. The median index in this case was 8146 we did have a number of incomplete responses, 34.5% um, in total, um, but that at least gives you a sense of how um, everybody responded and we were able to provide those index scores to respondents so they could see A, what category they fell into and how many of their peers were there with them and who was on either side. For those that fell into the engage, um, category, scoring zero to 50 on the Bonner index. What I'll do now is just give you a very high level summary of those core categories that we, we walked through to begin with. On the brand side, uh, what we saw for those respondents in this category is that brand and C-suite and boards feel very disconnected. Uh, messaging isn't structured across all functions yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Leadership, still fragmented. Organization is still operating in silos in many cases, and there is a lack of alignment for performance. Stakeholder experience, lack of customer centricity, um, most of them lacking voice of the customer insights, limited insights of this at the C-suite and board level. So the C-suite and board level are still somewhat very disconnected from the stakeholder and the experiences they're having with the organization. Internal communications. Still mostly HR focused at this stage. Employee feedback is irregular, not necessarily aligned with external tops. Data and analytics, lack of alignment between performance roles and KPIs, and certainly a limited view in C-suite um, and board. And from a technology perspective, gaps between deployed tech and value realized, limited use of AI at this stage, but a very loose governance for return on investment. At the embed category, these are for respondents scoring between 51 to 75. 
from a brand perspective, we're starting to see some realized synergies between brand and the C-suite and boards. There's deliberate brand messaging and deployments, leadership evolving during the growth, um, actively trying to break down silos, and we are certainly seeing increased cross-functional collaboration. From a stakeholder experience perspective, there is a desire to focus on the stakeholder. Still lacking a single view of the customer, mind you, but there is deeper customer engagement. Internal communications. We're moving away from just HR solely focused comms, and now we're starting to see it being leveraged for process improvement and workflow. So getting employees more engaged in the day-to-day. -day. Employee satisfaction is more integrated with strategy and planning. Data and analytics, certainly greater insights at the C-suite and board level. Um, definitely leveraging those insights for strategy and budget planning and performance is much more grounded in statistics. Technology, more deliberate cross-business integration. There is a single source of truth, meaning there is a core framework or platform that they are using um, to house all of their data. The technology is seen as a growth catalyst. Those in the Excel category, those scoring between 76 and 100 on the Bonner in Index. From a brand perspective, brand in the business, very well integrated, continues to evolve, um, but they're leveraging brand for market position and certainly in most cases, M&A activity as well, if that's appropriate. Leadership, directly deriving go growth. Silos are mostly gone. Lessons learned are being applies, applied and there is proactive succession planning. Stakeholder experience. Customer centricity is a priority. C-suite and board have very good touch point, uh, line of sight, and they are active in planning. From an internal communications perspective, it is the backbone of an engaged culture. Employee feedback holds management accountable. Um, they are using it for talent and planning. Data and analytics, active use of analytics to inform decision-making, budgets, strategy, and planning. And technology, there is an integrated technology roadmap. They are in a sequence of continuous development. And technology is at the is the backbone of uh, solid and reliable forecasting and insights. That is a brief summary of the survey responses that we received and some of the um, some of the outcomes that we saw. I'm going to hand it back over to my colleague James so that he can talk to you about the one on one uh, feedback that he received. So what we did is that we grouped the insights coming out of the confidential one on one interviews under three themes. What do boards and C-suites look for when hiring consultants? What are the keys to a successful engagement? And then finally, the impact of generative AI on company governance. Dave, next slide, please. Boards and the C-suite are looking for a proactive partner who will resolve successfully the problems for which they were hired. They'll also solve new problems as they become apparent. And ideally, they will solve or work on, this, on the schema, or perhaps we should say on the mindset of how to manage the unexpected, the unknown. This is something which is important because time and again, leaders will tell us in their planning, James, what do we do? We know that there is something that's going to happen. We don't know what. And we know that it will impact our performance dramatically. How do we prepare and manage successfully for the unknown? That is a major preoccupation of boards and the C-suite. Boards and management know that an unexpected crisis will surface during their fiscal year. And this, as I mentioned, is in spite of their very best risk management strategies. And then the question becomes how to manage. In a word, consciously or unconsciously, they want to work with a consultant who is Mr. or Ms. Fixit. And what do they mean by that? They're looking for a highly competent consultant who they trust to deal with any problem, either directly or through 
proven partners or associates who they've vetted and who can guarantee, they can guarantee the work of these partners. Of course, this is not true of all, of all companies and it's not true for all engagements, but it is true for a significant number of them. They look for consultants who will dare to challenge the board and management appropriately and professionally when warranted. They're not looking for yes people. Boards in the C-suite expect the consultants to be ethical. This would seem obvious, but it's not always the case. In fact, in one, in one example, a consultant tried to ingratiate himself with board members by putting down the CEO and his team behind closed doors. This engagement turned out to be short-term, short-lived, but it's not always the case. In terms of fees, boards and management understandably don't want to overpay, but there is a however, and they understand the however, and it is that ultimately you get what you pay for. So they're willing to pay more for quality work and consultants who can and do deliver. Next slide, please, Dave. Boards and management must take ownership for the engagement. It starts at the top. If it doesn't, the engagement will not meet expectations. And worse, it may fail altogether. Alignment between the board and management is imperative for the success of the engagement, and indeed, for the smooth running of the company itself. If this engagement, if this alignment between the board and management isn't there, the company will become increasingly dysfunctional until such times when radical remedies are required. The telltale sign of dysfunction is when a board becomes less and less strategic and correspondingly more operational. This often indicates that the board has lost or is losing confidence in the CEO. The cost to the organization is significant. A key component of a successful engagement is that the company and the consultant agree at the very start on outcomes that are clear, practical, and integratable seamlessly into the day-to-day. -day. The success of the engagement is then measured against the timely delivery of these outcomes. Dave, next slide, please. AI is progressively becoming more pervasive and it must be handled with care. This was the consensus of the people I interviewed. Today, many board and management teams see AI essentially as a productivity tool. Increasingly, we hear of AI replacing jobs. The 2023 McKenzie report says that generative AI would ought to automate between 60 and 70% of employee workloads. The World Economic Forum summarized the situation by saying 42% of employers will prioritize training workers in AI by 2027. The nature of work Indeed, the nature of business itself is changing radically. The potential for cost savings and efficiency gains produced by generative AI excites CFOs, 
mightily. But boards and the C-suites must also gauge the associated perils. For example, the surge in electricity demand for data centers is now outstripping available power supplies in many parts of the world. Some large corporations are turning to nuclear energy as a solution with its own inherent set of risks. AI is mutating rapidly. Its broad impact is largely unknown. Board and management needs much more awareness of the effects of AI on company governance. John Barker, our moderator, and the Institute's Senior VP of AI gave two virtual advisory board master classes last year on AI and corporate governance. John described the case of a factitious high growth company that was expanding globally. In recounting the company's story, John asked the audience to identify potential governance risks that were associated with AI. Out of some 80 attendees, six risks were identified. John revealed that he had embedded 50 significant risks in his story. That means that a group composed of past, current, and future board members, senior executives, and entrepreneurs had failed to identify 44 out of 50, or 88% of the embedded risks, many of which were existential for the company. In one case, they lost their entire intellectual property. While deemed as very important, AI was not top of mind for the majority of the people interviewed. AI needs to do, or actually boards, need to do a better job in fostering awareness of AI amongst its members and in the C-suite. They have to instill in their members a flexible, adaptive, and anticipant mindset that will enable them to thrive amongst the new challenges and opportunities that AI affords. According to the US-based National Association of Corporate Directors, the NACD, and the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the NAIC, these leaders do have a North Star, and that North Star is purposeful and ethical leadership. Dave, back to you. Lastly, what I'd like to walk you through is just a summary on the responses that we received on uh, return on investment expectations. Uh, and a couple of key takeaways here. <clears throat> um, what we found was when we asked participants what their expectations were for ROI from sustainable performance and revenue generation, there was a, a bunch that sort of spread the, the gamut there on some of the options. But I found that these were notable and these were consistent across all of the five categories we queried where respondents were either not sure or did not know what they should expect or what they were getting on sustainable performance and revenue generation, 30%. Leadership retention costs, 32% not sure or didn't know. Overall employee retention, 32% not sure, don't know. The overall impact on employee satisf satisfaction and culture, 25% not sure, don't know. And then those that were not sure or didn't know um, what they should expect or what impact they were receiving on overall reputation and shareholder value, 23%. The reason that we've called these out is that there seems to be some uh, a lack of clarity either on what should they be receiving 
Um, but more importantly, across the board, it does indicate that a, a decent chunk, almost a third in some cases um, of respondents were either not tracking or not measuring these returns on investments in their leadership capabilities and on their ability to lead purposefully in their organizations. This is interesting compared to those, uh, that high percentage that were either in that second or third category that were making good progress along all of these fronts. While there was a clear focus on growth, on integration, on collaboration and driving performance, there is still um, a fair number of respondents that were not measuring these investments and allocating them or attributing them uh, directly to some of these cost centers. So we call that out just um, in the event that there's an opportunity for deeper discussion there, but it was a very interesting finding. In closing, um, what we would say is that um, ROI and investment in leadership development, um, hard for most to quantify. Uh, this does present opportunities. Um, for, to either create a roadmap uh, for transformation and increased integration, um, to align performance with continuous improvement KPIs, and to certainly identify opportunities for improved C-suite and board connectivity um, insights um, that can have a positive impact on capacity, but certainly operational efficiency and culture as well. Um, we didn't uh, notice that engagement across VAB um, was low at 8%, but we also respectfully acknowledge the fact that um, this potentially could have been timing. Um, these were very busy individuals um, and it was probably something that they, some of them might not have had time to get to within the time window um, that we provided. Um, there's certainly opportunity for similar engagements. Um, for each of those VAB member organizations within their own organizations to obtain that similar inside out perspective. The dysfunctional C-suite and board dynamic um, that we uncovered in the survey results, but also certainly that James spoke to as well, um, is limiting operational and performance-based improvements. Um, and one of the things um, that James just finished speaking about is that adoption of AI still very loosely governed not fully understood um, and presents the potential for increased risk when it comes to resource allocation, the impact that the introduction of AI might have on culture and morale, and certainly the ability for the organization to realize value from that investment. These are the insights um, that we received. Um, pleasure to share them with you today. And, and then John, James, uh, do we want to open it up for questions? Well, James and David, thank you for an excellent presentation. I actually would like to present you with a prediction made by Gartner <clears throat> that I believe is relevant in this context. And I'd like to get both of your thoughts in the context of what you've just presented. And here is the quote from Gartner, and I might need to repeat it a few times because there's a lot in the content. So Gartner has said, and I believe this is a bit exaggerated, but it's in the right direction. By the year 2026, more than 1 million human employees and human beings will engage with robotic or synthetic virtual colleagues. And nearly 80% of those interactions from, uh, uh, instigated by humans will be semi-automated. Um, this is the idea of agentic AI where humans are able to use artificial intelligence as an agent. <clears throat> so more than 100 million workers globally engaging with AI as a synthetic virtual colleague or engaging with a robot as a virtual colleague. So how will this affect governance, morale, culture, resource allocation, and the realization of value. I'm curious what you think. Great question. James, if it's okay, I can, I can yeah, jump oh, in really quickly. Yeah. Um, 
you know, immediately from a positive perspective, I think there's a there's an opportunity to leverage AI in that farm as a source or as a means of deep learning. So the opportunity to um, to spend more time maybe in a very focused manner, whether that's troubleshooting, problem solving, conflict resolution. Um, I do think that there's an opportunity for that to have a positive impact on the organization. From a governance perspective, um, I can see that being a little unruly as far as being able to provide oversight into how that technology is used or deployed, and then to what degree any outcomes or learnings um, from those synthetic engagements, how are those brought back into the organization um, and are those being are those structured? Are they are they being given a framework with which to transition them from a, a virtual environment into say a real environment, but into a real world environment um, so that they can actually be deployed and maybe leveraged um, within the day to day? So just two thoughts that popped into my head, John, when you were surprising statistic, uh, I must say. That, that that number seems especially large, but I'm not surprised, I guess, given by the rapid advancement, um, not only in deployment, but in capability of the technology. So my question would be the following. It would be the impact on leadership. So we're talking about from the perspective, if I miss if I misunderstood John, please tell me. But what I thought I understood from the quote is that they're talking very much from coworkers, colleagues, and so on. Yes, yes. And in that context, <clears throat> that has this whole set of, of issues in terms of what is a team, how do you interact with a team, what is psychological safety, if there is that in that context, and what have you. The reason I mentioned psychological safety is that according to Google and so on in their studies, that it's a predicator of uh, team dynamics and team performance. And if we're dealing with with a, a robotic entity, uh, we may wonder if we can really have the same kind of psychological safety as we would without them. And if that's the case, we'd have to rethink one of our major predicators mm -hmm. on performance. Mm -hmm. But what really struck me was at the level of leadership and the board, because oftentimes what we're what at least my thinking on the work we're doing now with boards is to have them is to sensitize humans to the risks and opportunities of AI, of, of this world that is coming that we don't fully understand or even nearly understand what's happening. But if that world is then uh, peopled or at least that level, a board or even senior management, uh, by uh, by essentially robots or or perhaps and we know it's happening cyber orcs, mm -hmm. then it changes I would think the discussion immensely at least it would force us which isn't a bad thing to rethink mm -hmm. our mission and what we do. Mm -hmm. But that that quote by. Um, by Gardner, I think you said, is is not surprising given what we're seeing, uh, the evolution. It's on that path, mm -hmm. but it is a stark reminder of how I believe how unprepared we are for that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That that's just my thought on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, James, and I, I think it also speaks to the challenge that I think boards and C-suite leadership are going to have with the rapid pace of innovation and change. So I think, you know, as a rule, we've, we've become comfortable or become competent at beating, managing, um, and providing oversight and governance at a particular rate of change, usually driven by external industry factors whether that's the economy, whether that's you know other external factors, but I think what organizations are really going to struggle with is to 
adapt at the speed of innovation uh, and, and technological improvements as they try to bring them into the organization. I think the risk of adoption um, is significant um, because of its ability once adopted to almost outpace the organization's ability to manage it um, and to get value out of it. So, you know, I think there's the potential for investments to go awry because they're not able to stay on top of it and, and be able to adapt their, either adapt their business to it or adapt it to their business. Um, so I think that speed um, becomes, uh, becomes a challenge from a value realization perspective. But I also think that the risks involved to the workforce, uh, the work, the risks involved um, to the human element of um of ai or or technology um that like we're talking about now it could have a significant impact on the workforce globally mm -hmm. um and i don't know that we have a plan for that other than you know a broad stroke we can retrain and reskill i don't think you're going to be able to do that at the speed at which this technology has the potential to either displace or at the very least change how um, humans are deployed in their roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So, so John, you, you study this mm -hmm. uh, in closely and intensely. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I do think we're entering uh, truly a new era. I believe there is a lot of hype around AI a lot of misunderstanding. And um, I believe that the uh, capabilities of AI are very valuable, <clears throat> very useful, and can increase productivity. But I do perceive that some chief financial officers and some CEOs have higher expectations for AI than what AI can deliver today and underestimate the change management challenges, the human reaction, the human uh, psychological issues involved in interacting with AI. So I, I believe that we are truly, uh, we need a, set, a dose of realism about it. Uh, we need to educate ourselves as much as possible. <clears throat> Another issue that concerns me is that AI is constantly evolving. And mm -hmm. uh, the way the budgeting and the software development cycles work, uh, we, we budget as if technology stands still at a certain point in time. And, uh, you know, we companies revisit their budgets either quarterly or every half year or every uh, certainly every year. <laughs> so if you um, budget for AI at a certain point in time, and then there's radical change in the technology uh, in six months, you know, and your competitor begins the AI journey with that more advanced version of AI, uh, are you locked in to that older mindset and older technology? I just think that the implications are huge and, and you will need a multidisciplinary team that boards in the C-suite have typically not had um, as resources. So um, advisory boards will be necessary. There will need to be greater use of consulting talent uh, in, uh, for AI. So it's gonna be an interesting time, that's for sure. You know, it's interesting. You're talking about uh, increased consulting talent or what have you for AI. Uh, AI, yes, but also, are we not also speaking about, and you alluded to it, about the mindsets too? Yes, definitely. About how, how one perceives uh, AI, how one perceives the workplace, how one perceives the role of mm -hmm. an employee. And in this case, we're speaking about two types of employees, about the human employee, about the robotic employee, and perhaps we're speaking about a, a workplace yeah. where we're talking about the, the integrated uh, workplace of the two. Well, uh, here's an idea. Think of this. What if you are asked, we wish for you, uh, let's say you have an employee who has deep institutional knowledge, deep subject matter expertise in the core business, 
has been employed by a business, let's say for more than 10 years, and the employee is asked, transfer your knowledge to the AI algorithm, and then you'll be out the door. We won't need you anymore. Uh, of course, I believe that's not a correct approach, but I believe it is an approach that will be used. And yes. that, that harms morale. And um, uh, so, I, but I believe that dynamic will be occurring in businesses. So you spoke about in the spirit of the study that, uh, that Dave and I have just been speaking about the survey yes. and the insights we've derived. Yes. One of the questions we asked uh, the members is what do you look for from consultants in this universe? And they shared based on where they are today, what they saw, and that's what we gave you today. Now, based on the reality you've just described, you said that companies or organizations will be needing of consultants to help. Well, what kind of, of, of advice or what kind of programs, or what kind of information will they be looking for from mm -hmm. consultants such as us to be able to give them and to help them? Well, we, we might not have the AI technical expertise yet, but I foresee a multidisciplinary consulting team. It's, there probably will not be a single individual who can provide the full range of services. There will be need to be some level of technical knowledge in AI. There will need to be some level of knowledge of a client's industry and the dynamics in those industry and the use cases for AI in that industry. There will need to be knowledge of the legal and regulatory issues, particularly uh, regarding intellectual property and uh, data privacy, uh, particularly where personal information is involved, trademarks, patents, copyrights, um, uh, accounting, because uh, technology appears in the profit and loss statement and the balance sheet differently from uh, expenses for human capital. And that will have to be considered as well in terms of how you allocate resources. Uh, I, I doubt there will be one person who has all that knowledge and capability, but I think you could have it with the team. Yeah. So are you speaking about hiring a consulting firm, let's say, that would play very much the role, uh, and excuse the analogy, but it's the one that comes to me, of a general contractor, meaning that the general contractor will have a his or her knowledge base that will be applicable in certain areas. Perhaps. But they would then be able to bring yeah. in uh, the vetted, recommended, under their auspices, and they would have the responsibility. Yeah. yeah of bringing in the types of, of knowledge that is required in, in, in this evolving situation. So yeah, some, like, perhaps, you know. perhaps it's, it's a useful analogy. I do think it's a useful analogy actually. Um, but, uh, I, I think we'll see some boutique consulting firms appearing on the scene in particular vertical industries, you know, AI and healthcare that can bring that yeah. level of knowledge AI and let's say, consumer goods, manufacturing. Uh, so, uh, and then there might be consulting firms in um, horizontal applications such as marketing and sales, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that, that apply regardless of the industry. So vertical and horizontal, it's gonna be very interesting, that's for sure. <laughs> so I'd mm -hmm. like to ask, um, we're getting to the end of our session. Do either of you have any additional comments or observations? Dave, you want to lead off or? Sure. Yeah, no, just, you know, thank you for the opportunity to share um, the results of, of this engagement. Um, I do think, you know, one of the things that really stood out, we've, we've talked about AI and, um, and the introduction of technology and some of the opportunities and challenges that are presented there. But I think the recurring theme is the ability the willingness and the capability for C-suite and boards to stay as connected to these uh, changes as they start to ripple through not just organizations, but markets, uh, economies, uh, countries, and of course, globally and the impacts that it has 
so that they can fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities, but also ensure that they're they're leading their organizations by making decisions based on the latest and most up to date and relevant um, insights and analysis, um, so that they can be doing the right thing uh, and fulfilling the role that their organizations need them to fill. Mm -hmm. So my my final observation, if I may, is that. Um, we're at a point where we're looking out into the future and all we see really is the unknown. We have hypotheses, we have theories. Uh, mm -hmm. As we know now, scientific theories are changing pretty well day to day just because of new knowledge. Um, it is a time of great uncertainty. It's a time for many of great fear. Mm -hmm. uh, but if our role is to help, our role is to help by being able to uh, to address people's fears, to work with them, to adopt a positive, not a, an idealistic, not a naive, but a positive mindset, and to look at the unknown as an opportunity rather than something to be feared. Mm -hmm. So I see that really as where we are, not only as a company, but as as businesses and as society, uh, so it's, it's very exciting. It's not for the faint of heart, for sure. uh, but it's very exciting. So, John, that's all I have to say. And for thank sure. you for moderating as you have. Well, I uh, thank you both for presenting today. Very interesting information. And with that, I'd like to say our session has come to an end, and I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day.